I think something's going to be ha- going to have to be done about all the things are buying up. You know, maybe there's some kind of lobby passed because they're buying everything, aren't they? <laughs> you know. That doesn't necessarily go as far as culture, but it's too much too soon, and it's a. Now there's problems with control and stuff like that. As the Asians move into our economy and into our businesses, um, it's going to be a situation where it's going to be more and more difficult to police the environmental hazards that are caused by big business. What do you think of Asian investment in Vancouver? I'm not going to say because I don't like it. The calm and serenity of Vancouver is nothing short of illusion these days. Racial tensions are growing over the new Asian investors. The problem is money and who owns it. The rescue of the Bank of BC is symbolic. Its fortunes were turned around when it was bought by the Hong Kong Bank. Now its Asian clients are putting their golden touch on Vancouver real estate. In fact, the Canadian branch is outperforming its Hong Kong parent, thanks in part to the new dominance of Pacific Rim trade. Our fortunes uh, rise with that growing awareness of Asia. We have specifically targeted on the Pacific Rim. Banks that provide trade finance services have historically followed the traders. I mean, we go back to our roots as a bank in 1865 when we set up in Hong Kong. We followed the British merchant fleet around to Hong Kong to finance the China trade. The same thing happened in Canada. Every year, Hong Kong investors spend two and a half billion dollars in Canada, most of it on real estate. You are about to meet a vision for the BC Placelands. People started wondering last year when the former expo site was sold to a Hong Kong developer, not a local one. Politicians lined up to congratulate each other on the $340 million sale. After years of courting Asian investors, they finally attracted a big one. Big smile, please. The massive development is being overseen by Victor Lee on behalf of his billionaire father, Lee Ka Sing. Lee Sr. is known as a shrewd businessman whose every move is watched by the Hong Kong press. First of all, uh, what about the price? Um, I think the price is quite reasonable. Lee Ka Sing has the highest profile of all the Asian investors in Vancouver. He represents a trend some Canadians find disturbing. Millions of Asian dollars are pouring into downtown real estate, and the flow has just begun. I've seen about five, six big players over the last year, and um, I think there are many more coming, and uh, 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 I think there's more money than projects right now in Vancouver. How big? Uh, I would estimate approximately 30% of all the transactions. Uh, in commercial activity is Asian extraction. That represents more than $500 million of commercial property. Vancouverites were shocked to learn that some condominiums sold out in Hong Kong before they were built and before Canadians were given a chance to buy them. Asians have bought no less than five Vancouver hotels. Their money is also fueling a construction boom that reflects confidence in Vancouver's future. I think that Vancouver uh, is seen as a very solid investment at the moment. And uh, those are business decisions that are made irrespective of uh, what whatever we could do at City Hall. I think the bottom line for any businessman, any developer, is whether or not the investment makes sense, whether it's viable, and if it does, they'll do it. But Asian money is also causing problems for the city. In the planning department, scale models of new projects are stacked on top of each other. Planners are worried if we go too fast, our children will pay the price of congestion in a concrete jungle. 
developers are lobbying for higher densities. And if they get their way, this is how Vancouver will look heading into the 21st century. We cannot take the densities of Hong Kong here immediately, but we do know we're creeping into higher and higher densities all the time. Now, how much we are prepared to accommodate intense development is to do with the debates that are currently going on with people in the city. You must remember that the, the city of Vancouver proper is a peninsula. There's a finite amount of land. And if the things look beautiful from a helicopter, when you take the pictures and people go, oh, no, they're going to sit there and there's going to be these 30-story buildings and they won't be able to see the beauty of the setting, which is not the city of Vancouver. If they're building high rise for the millionaires right beside it, they build social housing along with it at the same time and then they cannot back up. We can't consistently remove working people <clears throat> and the working poor further onto the outskirts and expect them to just go away. What you're creating is a ghetto. Why do you think people have this feeling they're losing control of their city? Well, there's a number of reasons. I think one of the reasons is that Vancouver does sit in the Pacific Rim. The Pacific Rim is the most active economic basin in the world. And we, although people have talked about it for over a decade now, suddenly we're starting to feel the results of that. The infusion of cash from Hong Kong helped to transform Robson Street into a trendy location for exclusive shops and clothing made in Hong Kong. Asian shoppers are helping to revive the local retail trade. People in Vancouver have to look across the Pacific and face the Pacific and not turn their back to it and try to look back to Europe or other parts because uh, it's natural that uh, we have this interchange and I think it's inevitable. The people that are coming here don't have to come here and I think that should be understood but they have many options available to them and uh, I think that this city and its leaders as I mentioned earlier are lucky that that we are the focus of this intent right now. They have to take extra care with any group of people uh, that have a lot of resources and want to spend them quickly in developing buildings of any sort uh, because sometimes the motivation for that is not to improve the quality of the environment or even improve the livability but in fact to invest money in some place where it's going to be apparently safe. In years that we've been trying to promote projects and um, properties to the offshore and finally they're coming and because they're coming in such a phenomenal amount we're not ready for it but we were hoping for it and then now they're here we're not ready. <laughs> Suspicions are being cast over the source of the new money. Vancouverites aren't sure they want to live in a global city and have their real estate traded around the world. There's even talk Hong Kong money is ruining us. Would you agree with me, Mrs. Doyle, that uh, this bucket full of money, they're distorting the market, the real estate market? No. You wouldn't agree with that? No, I wouldn't. I would you say, of would... course, they're having an impact on the market, but so are a lot of investors from other parts of the country and from other regions of the world. Tomorrow, Asian investment in Vancouver's changing neighborhoods. <laughs> we talk about this every day. I am totally opposed. Totally. I, I don't think it's fair at all. Well, people like us, young married couple, and we've lived here all our lives, and we can't afford to buy a house. We save and we save, and it doesn't matter because the prices keep going up because the foreign people keep coming in and keep buying. And The lot size is 49.5 by 166. 49. Beautiful view. 40, oh, less than 50 then. 
$49.5. The price tag on this 38-year-old house is $468,000. Many of the prospective buyers are Asian and well-to-do. They look at properties, they decide what they want very quickly, they make all cash offers. If they have to do any financing, it seems some of them want to do it in their own banks in Hong Kong because the interest rates are much less than ours over here. And, um, but basically it's all cash. Mm -hmm. In pockets of the city, you have some of the more expensive houses and those houses are being driven up. And that's because there are a lot of Hong Kong investors or offshore investors who are willing to pay the higher prices. I am uh, originally from Hong Kong, but I have uh, 12 years in uh, Central America. But now the market is very good, so we're coming down here. <laughs> oh, is that why you came here? Yeah. And are you interested in, in living in these houses or tearing them down? Uh, no, I take, a, I take a look, you know, maybe it's, you know, some nice property and uh, we're going to buy it. <laughs> But in the, the Surrey's or other areas where the houses prices are down $120,000 or so, that's not where they're buying for the most part. Vancouver is a city of contrasts, of crowded streets and inviting avenues of restful peace. Here, the most eloquent tribute to the industrial success of Vancouver is expressed in the homes of its inhabitants. Dozens of houses on the west side are being bulldozed. The one that stood here was renovated just before it was sold. Soon a new house will be built worth double the money and double the size. The neighborhood is changing. There's a construction boom for single family housing as a result of the active real estate market. The neighbors have noticed Asians moving into big houses that don't conform. 200 concerned homeowners have formed a group to try to persuade builders to think first of the neighbors and the character of their blocks. We've talked to some people that are building houses and asked them if they couldn't do something that's more in keeping with the character of the neighborhood, but uh, I guess generally there have been some people that have responded. There are others that have said, uh, look, we're building what we want and that's all there is to it. We're within the laws that exist and what more can you ask? We do need some regulations because we've tended to say in the past every man's house is his castle. You know, if he, if he owns it, he can do what he likes in it. And if you come from another place where the idea of neighborliness is different from the idea of neighborliness here, you tend to do things which are unneighborly. The reaction against uh, big houses is a real one, uh, and uh, I'm concerned uh, about that. Uh, but I'm equally concerned about the fact that there's this linkage being made uh, that, and that it's the fault of Chinese immigrants. I don't think it is. From City Hall, there's no clear view of property ownership. There are no numbers to prove that all the homes are being bought up by Hong Kong Chinese. It has never been a priority to find out. Our young people can't afford to own their own homes. They're going to look for scapegoats. And one of the scapegoats they're looking at right now is a very small minority of purchases of existing homes that are coming from offshore and, and blaming it on that. At $600,000, this home is beyond the reach of most Vancouverites. The house is about 3,000 square feet. The agent, Grace Kwok, sold almost 200 units last year. Many of her clients are from Hong Kong. This is a subfloor heating, so all the tiles are warm. Hong Kong people like the amount of space they can buy in Canadian homes. They like the green spaces and the prices. But Grace Kwok is worried about the negative reaction to Asian buyers. If limits are put on foreign ownership, their money will find another home and BC's image as a tolerant society will suffer. <laughs> it's got an open feeling to it. Yeah. Vancouver's unique in itself is a good environment, good place to live and I think people like to choose Vancouver because of the weather and the environment itself and um, let's not turn our good thing into a, something that's very bad for you know to shut people off from mm, you know I'm 54 years in Vancouver mm -hmm. and uh, I believe about the end of May we'll be moving to Alberta um, I'm looking around I'm in the construction business and I find that every time I turn around I'm dealing with uh, Chinese who then deal with Chinese and I get to do an all the bidding and it's a very bad situation. Tomorrow, Asian investment and its impact on our communities. 
uh, a friend of ours who is, uh, I think, third generation Canadian, um, was driving around in her Mercedes. And uh, she was parking her car, and uh, she was backing up and, and, and just touched the car behind her. Um, the woman uh, got out of the car uh, and, and, and started screaming at her, screaming at my friend, um, and uh, said something to the effect that uh, you people from Hong Kong are all alike. Classrooms changing. Our whole neighborhoods are changing too. They they come in and buy old houses, knock them down, and then some of the houses they build are nice, but some of them they're just monstrosities. They're just they don't fit in with our neighborhoods. Big, big, big brick buildings with huge fences. I mean, it's very not very sociable. You know, if, if you think about it. Our neighborhoods are changing. The status quo is being shaken up. And uh, for people who are in a certain position within the status quo, uh, don't like that. This Chinese New Year's, there was a lot of talk about the new wave of Chinese immigrants. My father came to Canada in 1910. And uh, when they come, they, they come with nothing, a bare hand. They come here to, to work and hoping to make a better life you know, for the future. Stop. Now it's different. Eh? Now, today, you go down to the airport to see the new immigrants come in. You've got nice cargo down there, remember DC Ben or, <laughs> or BMW, you know, a nice car. Eh? Everybody come in and have a nice home for them. You know, it's different. Chinatown is changing because of the new immigration. Climbing rents and property taxes are squeezing long-time merchants out of their stores. Chinatown may start looking like just another downtown commercial area. If only the wealthy Hong Kong Chinese can afford to do business here. Right now in Chinatown we have many uh, 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 business uh, uh, taking over by the Hong Kong immigrants. Well, we could get around, we could communicate. Uh, of course, there are some uh, wealthy wealthy class of millionaires, uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, now this, they, they, these are different type of people that uh, they don't, you know, we don't see them much around the Chinatown here. The new wave of Chinese have moved into the most desirable neighborhoods on the west side. They're mostly professionals who want their children to attend the best public schools. Most students at McGee Secondary, for example, go on to university. It used to be an all-white school. About one-third of the 900 students are now Asian, who are being pushed into the mainstream of a foreign system. Integration may not be the main objective because, uh, especially when they're first coming in, there are uh, many handicaps to overcome. They don't know the language, they're not familiar with the culture. I think our initial step is to promote a high degree of tolerance and understanding. What I like to do sometimes is take uh, material from different cultures and I try to introduce the different cultures so you appreciate the different type of people that are at our school. This here is the goddess of mercy. What does mercy mean? Students who arrive with little English are given two years to catch up in English as a second language classes. They invariably excel and surpass most of their classmates. But there is a cost for their instruction and everyone pays. Paradise. What does paradise mean? Heaven. Heaven. Okay. Heaven could be paradise, but paradise could also be on earth. If we're looking at roughly 12,000 students, uh, English as a second language requiring assistance, $700 extra per student, we're probably looking at uh, somewhere around uh, $28 on the average taxpayer per year. The school board has raised the banner of multiculturalism and promotes understanding of different cultures. This is an ideal picture of race relations in Vancouver. 
but the students have found it difficult to accept their Hong Kong classmates. They just sort of stay away. They don't even try to integrate within the system. Like within yeah, the, you don't really the see them at too school. many uh, social school events like they basketball games or dances. But they kind of stick together. We just don't communicate. Um, yeah. There's a language barrier, basically. Yeah. Is what I, it is. And it's just I think they should keep their customs and whatnot, but they, if they're going to come to Canada, they need to learn to live like Canadians as well. Yeah. Yeah. Our laws don't say that, though. Our laws say that you can have your own culture. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's just an understood But maybe that should be changed, like the yeah, states have a big melting pot like where everyone's uh, whatever American. There needs to be more done in terms of, of education right across the board and indicating what the advantages of being a Pacific Rim uh, center is and, and how we can benefit. Things are not going to stay the same. They're going to change. Uh, we're not, more we're not willing to learn the, our language is still... No, no, no. no. Yes. I wouldn't say that. No, no, no. Just force the force. They can't really say that because you don't know if they're trying to learn or not, right? When I uh, fir first uh, grew up, uh, in Vancouver, in Carisdale, I was the only Chinese in the school, and uh, I remember the first uh, two weeks or a month, I had a fight every day with somebody because somebody would call me by names, you know. But over time, uh, I think my schoolmates, uh, guys like Mike Harcourt, and all saw me as just another human being, and just like them. And <laughs> I listened to Canada AM the other day. And they were crying the blues because 30% of Canadians have finally admitted they're racist. Well, when another 30% do, we'll get some action on some of this immigration thing. That's my opinion. No to racism! No to racism! As soon as you stand up and speak and try to express yourself by what we're trying to do, it's slander as racism. Well, by God, if that's racism, I'm a racist! Down with the racist division of the people! Down with the racist division of the people! Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be in trouble. The organizers of this meeting at the Scottish Cultural Centre deny they are racist. They don't like the idea of only 5% of the immigration coming from Europe. They want fewer let in from other countries, including Asia. They're worried they're becoming the minority. Because the fact is, and this is the cause for our concern, that immigration from Britain and Europe has decreased so drastically over the past 30 years. It has changed, and there's awesome amounts of money coming into this country. And it bothers them. If that awesome amount of money was coming in from Britain and Europe, I don't think we'd have this meeting tonight, do you? As many as 10,000 Hong Kong Chinese might emigrate to B.C. this year, many of them will be professionals who bring their money and their expertise. Immigration officials say they will create jobs instead of taking them away from Canadians. And they do have supporters in Chinatown. We build Hong Kong from an ordinary port into an international finance center. Now, they are, they are people has a vision and a vitality. Now, those people come to Canada, we should welcome them with wholehearted. But they are not only bringing the money, but also their vitality and their vision to help Vancouver to become a international financial center. Tomorrow we'll meet three Hong Kong immigrants who fled the uncertainty of 1997 and now consider Vancouver their home. I think the company is in horrible shape and really not much we have to pay for. It's already a negative capital. And they come in different colors, but basically these are 17th century. Oh, is that right? Yeah, designs. Yeah. Uh -huh. Vancouver is Vancouver. This is not a little Hong Kong. Um, the new immigrants should understand that giving of oneself, whether that's in terms of time or money, is, is almost expected 
in North American society. And certainly would bring, I think, a lot of activity to the area and reinforce Robson Street. A and local development company owned by Asian immigrants is very aware of the backlash. To show its community spirit, it's offering to build a new arts club theater. Um, you know, there's no good having a performing arts scene if you don't have venues for people to perform in. Mm -hmm. The arts club wouldn't have to pay rent. In return, the company hopes City Hall will allow more retail space within the complex. The arrangement would meet the needs of both parties. I've always felt, particularly if we're looking at uh, replacing the Seymour Street Arts Club, that mm -hmm. it's important to have a downtown presence. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, uh, some uh, controversy, uh, you've heard in the media, uh, about uh, Asian investors, and uh, a lot of people, I think, feel uh, somewhat intimidated by that or threatened in some way. One wealthy Hong Kong immigrant feels so sensitive about his image that he's hiding his wife and children from public view. 41-year-old Stephen Liang runs Marco Polo Development Company. He got in as an entrepreneurial immigrant three and a half years ago. He wanted to escape 1997. What I've worked out with BC Tel is that we won't have to get assigned by BC Tel, so that'll speed it up. I want my family to live in a more, more harmony, you know, pace. If I want to make more money, I better stay in Hong Kong. You know, so money is only something that you make things happen. Because money is a, is, is a mean of incentive for a lot of people. The millions he made in Hong Kong have provided him with a central office and an expensive car to drive, but he realizes he'll need a strong local base to survive. The most difficult part to set up a, comp to set up a little company is how to understand the local situation. Once you have established something, you have to go out and communicate with other people. His first project was a 46-unit complex in Richmond, selling for less than 155000 Stephen believes there's only a limited market for luxury units, even among people from Hong Kong. It seems to be a lot of Hong Kong people also have that affordability problem. You know. A lot of those people cannot afford luxury houses. The Chinese character for book learning. Education is another reason why Chinese people are leaving Hong Kong. 44-year-old Joseph Lai and his family live in a modest condominium on the west side of Vancouver. They want to buy a house, but like many Canadians, can't afford one. They left Hong Kong to make a better life for their son, and because of 1997. Mm -hmm. It's more uh, an uncertainty, firstly for my son, so that I do not know, say, the education system or whether he will be given the opportunity to perform. The Chinese naturally would have a much bigger say in the running of Hong Kong. So I suppose many of the key posts will then be assumed by Chinese personnel. But basically, I think the company is in horrible shape and really not much we have to pay for is already a negative capital. Joseph was a top financial advisor in Hong Kong, but that's all behind him now. He's borrowing office space while he sets up a small development company in Vancouver. He sacrificed to come here, but he's also confident. The lessons he learned as a child will help him adjust. In Hong Kong, in China, the parents put an off emphasis in ensuring that their children get a proper education. So that I think uh, values like this and also say, in a sense, Confucius said also love your labor. I think all these are, say, uh, timeless values that could be preserved. 38-year-old Carl Ng, his wife Danny, and their daughter Joey left their family behind in Hong Kong eight months ago. Carl says something was missing from his life, although he used to make $50,000 a year as a computer sales manager. Being financially sound is the minimum, okay? But out of that, you want peace of mind. So at, when we are in Hong Kong, when we were in Hong Kong, we have more money, but we don't have peace of mind. Right? But coming here, we have less money, but we have peace of mind. 
Now they live in a modest townhouse. They arrived with $60,000 in savings. They put $40,000 down on their house, bought a small car, and have been living on a loan from their parents. He was nine months without a job. I used to be able to call the shots. Now I can. Um, the major difference is working from a planning, uh, planning viewpoint, and now I have to back at the front line again. And they come in different colors, but basically these are 17th century. Oh, is that right? Yeah, designs. Yeah. Uh -huh. Instead of directing sales, um, Carl is now an ordinary salesman at Casabella Furniture. Carl is aware that he and other immigrants will have to work hard to integrate and that it must be a two-way street. What most of us do is that we only care what happened inside the house. Outside the house is not my problem and they might not be contributing, and that might uh, hurt the image. I think it's quite natural for them to react uh, when there is a huge influx of foreign investment. But I think a second point is that I think the investors also have to behave themselves. I think they have to respect the local culture and the local tradition. If the local people really want to see Vancouver to become an international city, they have to make room for it to happen. And a lot of these people just think over the investment, think over the, the skill to make it happen. So that is what I'm saying, you know, everybody has to sacrifice. Tomorrow, options for the future. What price are we willing to pay for foreign investment?